and I am 30 years old. I am a Kuskani or a, a white settler um, uh, living on Cascadena territory in um, the community of Tusidlini, what mm-hmm. we call Ross River, um, in what we now call Southeast Yukon, but but more importantly in the in Cascadena territory. Mm-hmm. And I grew up um, between here and Whitehorse, so in the north, um, sometime in Whitehorse and sometime up in this territory of uh, Cascadena land. Can you tell me about the the uh, Indigenous uh, Land Guardian program? It's a program that we're, we're developing, and I guess the it starts with... I'm going to back up a little bit and give you some of the history to provide some of the rationale for the program, I think. Yeah, and of course. This, so this territory here is is unceded, um, and it's not part of the umbrella final agreement like a lot of the rest of the Yukon is. And there's, of course, as everywhere, there's a long-standing history of devastating impacts of colonialism that continue today uh, being felt here. And there's been attempts to work with the Yukon government and the government of Canada in many different ways to, in order for the, like the, the DENA to have more say in what takes place on their land. So everything from mining activity to outside hunting activity to research uh, projects run by different universities, anything that's taking place on their land, the uh, elders here, DENA, here at Sap or wherever, um, that they have a duty and responsibility to make sure that human activity on their land takes place in a good way that's in accordance with their um, with the way of this land, with what they what they articulate to be denakakusa on or um, denakatna in different ways of articulating how there's this this relationship. And so the dena here have a responsibility. Um, the elders always remind us that they have a responsibility to to make sure that these these ways are strong and to make sure that outsiders, when they're coming into their territory, um, walk well, walk in a good way on their land in respect of these kind of protocols or practices. And so for a long time that hasn't been happening with uh, the way that the Yukon government, the way that Canada, the way that many um, outside settlers and other visitors to this territory interact with the land. Um, it often hasn't been in accordance with uh, Dena practices. And so the real rationale behind this program is we've spent a lot of time now. I, I work with the with the Elders Council and in the Lands Department here, and we've spent years um, kind of uh, fighting Canada and the Yukon in the court system, in the Western court system, trying to get more control over how activity takes place on the land and also through different kind of negotiating tables with the governments. And um, there's been some wins there, but there's been also not a lot has changed and things continue, in many, to many extents kind of things continue. And so uh, this is taking a little bit of a different approach to the Guardian program. The rationale for the Guardian program is to, um, to train young Dana people mm-hmm. to be out the land in, in real deep relationship with their land and with those coming into their land to train them to be out there with knowledge and relationship with their land, um, monitoring what's taking place. So everything from, like I said, mining activity to outside hunters to other visitors, and then kind of making sure that those people are operating or to the best of their ability, making sure that those people are, are walking on their land in a way that's more in accordance with the practices that exist here. And so taking back some of that kind of jurisdictional authority and just living up to that responsibility that the elders articulate to care for their land in a good way. Mm -hmm. That's some of the rationale. And then uh, what we're trying to do is to really um, bring these young Dena people on the land in a training program with elders and other academics and other kind of instructors to uh, teach them a little bit more about first and foremost about their, their culture and their, um, their language 
and the Dena way of this land, uh, and also about some of the impacts of colonialism, historical impacts and contemporary impacts of, of colonialism in their territory, and um, and then offer them more skills and knowledge to be able to to uh, be on their land, being that kind of visible presence, taking a leading governing role in governing human activity on their territory. Wow. That sounds like a pretty uh, unique program, and which would be great, and I hope that actually happens. Is, is it is it happening right now today, or is it in the process of... I think it's kind of, it's starting through... Um, like it, we don't have um, employed Dena guardians out there on the land like they do in some other parts of what, uh, what we call Canada, like mm-hmm. in uh, uh, around Haida Gwaii, I think, and I believe some of the West Coast. They've got a really strong program that I've heard stories about, um, okay. where coastal Indigenous peoples are um, are on their water and on their land, and they're employed to be there, and they're employed kind of by their nations to be monitoring what's taking place and, and just kind of taking care of their land in many different ways. And we're not at the place yet where we have uh, folks employed to be doing that. Like, we, we want to be there in um, a few years, but we are, uh, through this program, it's more of, um, we're developing the educational component. So okay. we're, we're running some land-based programs that are that are targeted at training and educating those people to be able to step into those positions and also the elders council here is taking some steps towards um towards this kind of guardianship initiative in general um such as uh requiring that outside hunters obtain a hunting permit from the Ross River council like they did last year before they they hunt here yeah mm-hmm. so it sounds like it'll Combine traditional knowledge with Western knowledge, and and uh, those two uh, worlds would be coming together, and uh, past and present history. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's principally driven by Dena values, and so um, that yeah, it, I think it strives to combine those knowledges, but really the the priorities on Dena knowledge first yeah. and foremost. And where Western knowledge can come in and help with some of the the goals, right. that's great. It will be used. So where where science or other forms of Western knowledge can lend themselves to some of the overall goals, like water testing, quality, like water quality testing, or uh, maybe some different uh, climate kind of climate monitoring that the guardians could be doing that adopts uh, Western scientific methods. That's great. Uh, but definitely there's always going to be um, the Dena here are very strong about about uh, the protocols of respect and so things like collaring caribou um, catch and release fishing or putting tags on fish or other animals are very much against the the elders wishes here and so that type of those types of practices definitely won't be won't be practiced by the guardians and also um, I don't think the idea is not to just kind of accumulate knowledge for the sake of having data or or knowledge but really to to um, seek knowledge that's data that's going to be important in governance. And so it'll be like there'll be a series of I guess classes or uh, uh, courses that'll be on the land or and and in class like in a building and in on the land? Yeah, mostly all on the land. So the, like, okay. the training education programs going to be for between four and six weeks mm-hmm. taking place um, on the land in the mountains and actually um, in partnership with the uh, with the SATU and with the Chinta Bush University, who's a uh, land-based indigenous-led university program that offers students, mostly indigenous students, university credits, uh, to be take to be uh, on the land, learning from their elders and from indigenous academics about uh, kind of indigenous self determination and mm-hmm. um, decolonization. Mm-hmm. And what, what, so it's, a, it's 
sorry, this program is going to be a partnership between between ourselves here and the Ross River Denon Council and um, the Satu Renewable Resources Board and the Chinta Bush University. Wow, that's really cool. Um, what what would the age group of of the uh, training would be? We're figuring out some of the details yet. Uh, Can just well, open. Imagine, but I imagine it'll be pretty open. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what the minimum age will be yet, but I don't think there'll be a maximum age. So I guess the measure of success for the program would would be for the the students to be passing and completing all the on the line programs. Is that yeah. yeah. I think that the first and foremost, like the measure of success, is that the students at the end of the program feel comfortable on their land and feel comfortable and proud and more knowledgeable about the, their culture mm-hmm. and the, the, the Dena way of kind of respect and the Dena way of living on the land. So that's first and foremost. And hopefully students will also be more comfortable in their language, but also that, that students are comfortable as a community making governance decisions together in kind of a consensus way and in line with uh, Dena practices and that students are are more kind of ready to step into some of these guardianship roles and to to be an active visible presence on the land monitoring and and uh, making sure people are living in a good way on their territory now i just would ask you uh how would how, how, what is, what is indigenous education um, in, in your point of view? Well, I think that that is probably going to vary depending on where it takes place. So I wouldn't I wouldn't know how to answer that question for kind of is a generic answer to the question. Mm. Here, I think that indigenous education uh, necessarily takes place on the land in a very close relationship with the land and with community on the land and that the practices for uh, being on the land in a healthy, respectful way with one another are kind of present throughout. But uh, I wouldn't want to speak for Indigenous education in general because I think that that's going to, that depends on where you are and which elders and which um, folks are kind of taking the lead in that particular place. My next question is now um, to is well is it, is indigenous a, a, a term that you normally use? Um, it depends on the audience, I guess. Oh, okay. Too, but uh, the preferred, I think the preferred term here would just be Dena. Dena, okay. Okay. So, because people here are Dena. Right. Um, yeah. But if we're talking about kind of. These programs across across the continent or something like that, then maybe indigenous is a better term. Right. Um, but yeah, I think that here typically when we're talking about local local yeah. the local situation, this this program and stuff, um, the preferred term is Dena. Okay. How how would you define uh, education from from uh, uh, I guess I should ask you. You're you have an indigenous or Dene uh, background, right? Or um, well, not no. I'm I'm white, white settler. Okay. <laughs> but um, only in the sense that I've uh, spent a lot of time in this community and been partly raised by Dene people in this community. Okay. Uh, for for the program, the the um, uh, land guardians. What what would be the vision uh, for the future of that program in 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 the community locally? Um, I think that the the vision would be for um, well the the community has been clear that they want to see a program that's sustainable that goes on for many years and it just kind of um, offers young Dana people the opportunity to go to school on the land in ways that were more similar with how uh, people used to learn on the land here um, from the land and from their elders and from each other mm-hmm. so uh, so that there's a kind of a sustainable program that's continually offered 
um, and provides that opportunity. And then also that that the uh, alumni or the students that complete that program are able to step into some roles um, in terms of these guardianship roles that we're talking about so that they're more more ready to step into some of those guardianship roles and, and which like I explained earlier kind of lends itself to these other initiatives yeah. self determination for achieving that vision for the program for the for the community is there anything um, that would help achieve that vision is there anything that can help achieve that vision yeah to help make the make it a reality or or to achieve the uh, the vision of the program. Well, we always need uh, we always need some money to make these things happen. Unfortunately, we need right, of course, yeah. We must travel to get there to to help pay for gas and kind of um, um, to buy food and rent spaces and uh, employ some people to help run these programs, mm-hmm. teachers, cooks, and others. Um, so, yeah, we, money is a big thing. Like here, especially in this community, we don't have any core funding without a, a final agreement. Um, there's a lot of other, um, a lot of the core funding that other first nations get in kind of the Washington Canada Council doesn't receive. And, uh, Sorry, can't quite hear you there. Oh, I guess that we, we don't have all the same resources, monetary resources in this community. Out of final agreement, especially, and so, um, and so we're always kind of searching for um, different pots of money to be able to deliver these types of programs. Um, like, for example, we don't have a lands office here. We don't have a funded uh, lands office, no renewable resource council, or those other bodies that were born out of the the final agreement in the Yukon. And so, money is always something that we're searching for. 